Adult education is important because it gives us as adults the opportunity to get together in a room as adults and lets us talk to each other, support each other, and just hear from each other on how God affects our everyday lives. It's affected me by showing me that there are others out there that struggle with everyday life and that we all need God to help us get through that time. Me personally, it helps me go home after the Bible study and after the adult education class and be able to reach out to God and ask Him to help me get through life. I encourage you to participate in the adult education classes at Marion Methodist. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of worship. So uh, I just want to echo those things. We've, there's a lot of energy happening around our adult education this time of year, and this has been a great year. We've got classes that are just exploding. Um, for No matter where you are in your faith, there's, a, there's something for you, and it's been awesome on Wednesday nights to see our basic Bible class just blowing up and people coming in saying, hey, I, I just want to know the basics. And I know Pastor Mike's getting ready to start Exodus, as Sue was saying, in January. They'd love to have you be a part of that. You don't have to. There's no obligation. You don't have to sign up or pay money or anything. You just come and be blessed and know that uh, as you jump into your faith more and more, you begin to reap more rewards from that. If you're new with us this morning, I want to uh, let you know about some opportunities that you have to, to find out more information about the church and, and become involved. Uh, we have a fantastic website, MarianMethodist.org. We also have what's called a newcomer orientation, and it'll actually be next Sunday at 11 o'clock. And that's an opportunity to come together informally and uh, get to meet um, some of the staff and find out more information about how you can get involved in the church and just as importantly gives us a chance to get to know you. So that's down in the adult library and we do that every third Sunday of the month. So that would be next Sunday. We'd love for you to come and, and, and learn more about that. Speaking of uh, things happening next Sunday, our, our choir cantata will be happening at the 8.30 and 11 o'clock service next week. So if you I uh, want to hear that. Please come to those services. And also, for those of you that love to go Christmas caroling, uh, Dave Canada is going to be hosting a Christmas caroling party on the 23rd, which is a Tuesday night. Here at 6.30, we're going to meet here and then head out into the community and do some caroling. So that would be fun for those of you that, that want to do that. And then also remind you of our Christmas Eve schedule. We have many worship services that take place, uh, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5.30, 7 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Did I get all those right, Pastor Mike? So we know that that's a time where we're, this place is going to be just completely packed out. So uh, we're excited about that. But please keep those things in mind. And also as we prepare our hearts to worship this morning, let's keep in mind the most important thing is that we love Jesus and that he loves us. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And Luke writes these words. In the sixth month... Of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, your words never fail. And as we come together... Lord, we celebrate 
this time of preparation during Advent, in which we wait with quiet spirits, waiting to hear again the prophecies of the ancients fulfilled by your coming to be with us. We wait to see the wondrous things that you will do each and every day, and we wait with quiet assurance that you will hear and answer our prayers and respond to the concerns of our hearts. Lord, in the waiting, we see the glory and majesty of who you are, our sovereign God and King, and praise you for the mighty ways in which you touch all of your creation. Lord, we know that in all circumstances, our lives are here that with you, and you rejoice with us in times of celebration and happiness, and to hold us close in the days of pain and sorrow. We are so grateful for your presence during these times and for the people you place in our lives to be your hands and feet in our moments of joy and sadness. Lord, today we pray for all your people, specifically Kurt Musser, as he recovers from surgery. We pray for a speedy recovery and healing for him, and also for Charlotte Somerville, Ron Wood, and John Fowler, who were hospitalized this week. Lord, we lift up Kathy Labs as she mourns the death of her father, and for Tim Beertzer as he mourns the death of his brother. We ask that your spirit of comfort and peace be with them and their families. Lord, help us to be vigilant in our waiting this Advent season, but not passive. Show us those people and circumstances in which we can reach out and extend your love and mercy to those who are in need, to those who are hurting, and to those who need to know the good news of your coming and your coming again. Lord, we lift up all these things to you this morning, the prayers of our hearts, and the prayers we lift together for our community, for our church, and our world. Lord, we pray for Pastor Mike as he prepares to come to share this message with us. We ask, Lord, that according to the mighty name of Jesus, you would bless him and bless all of us as we pray together the prayer taught to us by Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh Jesus, we owe it all to you. We come before you now, faithfully gathered in awe of this great miracle that you have given us. We pray that as Pastor Mike delivers the word from your word, that they would touch our hearts and that they would bring us closer to this miracle of Christmas. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning to you all. So glad to be here. We are a church that didn't begin yesterday. We're part of a worldwide church that has many traditions and parts to it. One of those traditions in the Christian church is seasons of the year. And right now we're in the holy season of Advent. And as you might have noticed, Pastor Keith uh, came up and, and made a demonstrable uh, sign of that during uh, one of the, sing- the scene of one of the uh, hymns. Uh, by lighting the pink candle, the third candle on our Advent wreath. This is the third Sunday of the four-week season of Advent. And so we light the pink candle because in the Christian church, traditionally, um, pink has been the color of joy. And so this morning we write, light the pink candle as a symbol of Christ our joy and may the joyful promise of his presence call us to rejoice in the hope of our salvation. <clears throat> In 1992, pardon me, <clears throat> I had nothing to do but talk all day and my voice doesn't want to help. All right. In 1992, I was the campus minister at Simpson College in Indianola. It was summertime and I was minding my own business in my office when one of my students budged in right in the middle of the day and said, Pastor Mike, what are you doing this week? I didn't know what he was asking, but I was thinking I was going to do something other than what he was going to ask me next. I says, what do you need, Matt? He says, well, he says, I'm at summer games at Wesley Woods. And that's a camp you've never heard of, but our camp pastor got sick and had to go home. 
can you come be the camp pastor for a week? And I said, what's the camp pastor have to do? He says, not much. I said, well, I'm qualified for that. (laughs) He says, you have to preach a couple times and just kind of make sure we don't burn the camp down. I said, all right, I'll come. So all those years ago, I went out to Camp Wesley Woods, and of course it was hot, and there was 150 kids there or whatever. And all week long at summer games, they're jumping around, dancing around, doing all their kind of things. They have worship that's pretty contemporary in its style. And then it comes to Thursday, and i got to tell you, everything changed in those days at summer games on Thursday because that was the night where the crucifixion pageant was going to be held. And I said, wow, you guys are starting. All these college students like, tonight's Thursday, today's Thursday. We're, they're excited. It's like there was a drumbeat. All day long, steadily getting faster. I said, well, what's so cool about this? Say, oh, you'll see. I said, am I preaching? like, oh, no. A guy named Stan is coming. Now, some of you have been here a long time. You know who Stan is. He was the pastor here preceding me. And that night, I, I came to worship. I mean, I came with 150 sweaty kids, and we're ready for this powerful worship. And right in the middle of the room, different than it's been all week, there's a piano on a little stage and two tiki torches inside burning i said well this is going to be cool but then he says he starts he sits down and he starts like this and i want you to join with me because you know the words he says let's go oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him and, and we're singing this, and I'm thinking, this is stupid. It's summer. We're sweating to death. Why are we singing Christmas carols? And not only that, we didn't just stop there. He went on to, you know, about five more Christmas carols, banging them away on his piano, making these kids sing along to him. And then when I finally got over myself, which for you and me sometimes takes some time, I said, Wow, this makes complete sense. It makes complete sense singing Christmas carols in the middle of summer. It makes sense to me then and it makes sense to me now. Because here's, when I look at those words, here's what I see. All of our life, we're on a pilgrimage. We're either coming from somewhere or going to somewhere. And I know what Stan was encouraging those students to sing, and I know what I encourage you to sing now is that there is nothing more important in our lives than to come to Jesus. To come to Jesus and adore him. He's willing to rescue you from this life of one darn thing after another. He's willing to forgive you of your sins, and he's willing to give you a clean and pristine spirit and soul from which to live from this day forward. He's willing to provide you purpose for going on day to day. So believers... And those who desire to believe, to become part of the Christian community, come to Jesus and adore him. The hymn, O Come All You Faithful, which is given to you on your insert, and we sang a few moments ago, was written a little bit over 200 years ago. It was written in 1744 by an English layman named John Wade. He wasn't a priest, he wasn't a pastor, but he wrote this beautiful poem, the words that we sing, of course, in Latin, and then he wrote this extraordinary tune to accompany them, known uh, across the world as Adesti Fidelis, which translated literally means, be present or near, ye faithful. Adesti Fidelis was primarily used in Catholic churches for its first hundred years. And then in 1852, there was an Anglican priest uh, that named Frederick Oakley who wanted to use it in his own congregation. So he translated it in English, and at that time it became known by its present Name, O come all ye faithful, and that's the song we sing today. And the image of the carol seems to have great appeal and meaning for people of all ages. And today it's sung with enthusiasm by church groups around the world. We'll probably sing it on the caroling party that Keith mentioned because it's been translated from Latin into over a hundred languages. So let's take a deep look at this hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful. The first verse of O Come All Ye Faithful goes like this. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of Israel. See, verse 1 is kind of an instruction manual for believers, for, for Christians. God is coming to us and he desires and requires a response. Now, 
A lot of you have traveled into Florida or South Missouri. Have you, any of you ever been to that, that uh, restaurant called Lambert's? Raise your hand if you have. I want to see. All right. So some of you know that, that thing. At Lambert's, as you're driving down the interstate, it says, come to the home of the Throat Rolls. Now, Lambert's food is, it's okay. It's no better than anything else you can find on Collins Road. But they have this one part of their stick, is they make these fresh rolls. And if you want one at your table, the guy walks around the big basket and he'll say, rolls, rolls. And, and if, you, if you make a, yeah, yeah, I want one, he'll pay, take one out of that basket and fling it at you. Now, 60, 70 percent of the time, people actually catch them. So it's pretty cool. Uh, you you got to be ready, though, because you might take one in the head while you're eating your catfish or something like that. But here's the thing. I, I suspect because of liability and lawsuits and all that sort of thing, they've been required to, to not throw one unless someone's ready to receive one. You've got to make the gesture. Yeah, I'm I'm ready. Yeah, I I want one. The Holy Spirit, in a much more potent and powerful way, works like that. Elizabeth, pregnant with John the Baptist, a woman that had become pregnant in her older age, is meeting with Mary, the virgin that's engaged to Joseph. And she's telling her what's happening. And she says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And Mary's response is the same response as all Christians everywhere are supposed to have. She simply says, I am the Lord's servant. I'm willing to receive that which the Spirit gives me. I'm willing to do that which God gives you. And of course, the point when we sing, Oh, come all ye faithful, is that God comes to each of us in Christ. And if you want him, a response is required of you. We sing, oh, come, all, let us adore him. And it says, it says in the thing, come, all you faithful. Who are the faithful? See, believers need to take steps in your own holy pilgrimage. Believers need to take steps in your faith to make a holy pilgrimage. I, I said something like this a couple of years ago. And after this service, someone came down to the front and said, Pastor Mike, do I need to go to the Holy Land? Do I need to go to, to Israel? And I said, no, you you don't have to go to Israel, but you can't just let life pass you by either. You need to take steps. You need to take some steps. Pastor Keith and Vicki and I have been writing these articles for the front of the Marian Methodist about spiritual disciplines and practices. There's plenty to read there, but, you know, some of the steps that a Christian can take is to read the scriptures, to, to, to pray more frequently, to serve others, to give of themselves to others. But you have to take steps. You can't simply um, sit still and let the world go by because the faithful come. The faithful come, which simply means this is you've got to do whatever it takes for you to adore Christ. You've got to do whatever it takes you to get to the cradle that leads to the cross. You've got to do whatever it takes and takes the, take those steps. We also sing that, God, that we are to be joyful when we sing. In the New English Version, the Bible has Elizabeth saying, for there is nothing that God cannot do. There's nothing that God cannot do. See, when we sing, oh, come all you faithful, we're acknowledging this. Whatever mess that you've been put into, or whatever mess that you've put your own life into, that you've created for yourself, God can and will save you in it or from it. You heard a few minutes ago Craig Collins uh, talk on the video screen talked about my basic Bible class. We've been talking about this theme a lot around the story of Joseph. See, the question is, will God deliver you from your circumstances or will God deliver you in your circumstance or through your circumstance? And the fact of the matter is, and Paul writes of this in Romans, everything works together for good for those who love the Lord who are called according to his purpose. It may not feel in the mess that you're in right now that things are working for good, but when we say There's nothing that God cannot do, and we believe that. We know that God will take us through that and might be using that circumstance to make our lives better so we can be joyful and faithful as we sing of it. He also might remove us and and allow us to transcend above the circumstance. That is the will of the Lord. But what we know for sure is that God will use or rescue us from our circumstances, and that is cause for joy. And so in the hymn we say we sing triumphantly. We do sing with triumph because the battle with sin and life and death has already been won. We don't have to go fight that battle for ourselves. The Lord of the cradle and the Lord of the cross has already prevailed in that. And so we can live triumphantly as winners 
What a wonderful thing to go into battle knowing you've already won. And what the, what the song tells us, what the scriptures tell us, is that in Christ, you cannot be beaten. Because Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, has already prevailed. And nothing in this world or the one to come can defeat us. The second verse goes like this. Now, I'm, there's a quiz at the end of the second verse. So pay attention, especially you ex-Catholics and Lutherans. Methodists, you have a responsibility too, because you should know this. True God of true God, light from light eternal, lo, he shuns, not the virgin's womb, son of the father, begotten, not created. Now, I know that comes from scriptures, but where in church tradition does that come from? Anybody know? Yes, sir. Pretty close, Bill. Next page is the Nicene Creed. I knew, I knew I'd have an ex-Catholic that knew it, though. All right. It, it is the, it, it's from the Nicene Creed, which is on page 880 in your hymnal, the Nicene Creed, written by the Council of Nicaea. And the reason that an ex-Catholic would say that is that's the first creed, and that's usually the one you learn first. So usually the one you learn first. The Nicene Creed says this. We believe in one Lord. You guys look at the screens. I'll read the words. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. So you see, when we sing in that second song, we're talking about some very serious and deep and rich theology and some understanding. When we sing, Oh, come let us adore him, and we sing, True God of true God, there's this incarnational theology that's going on that says that Jesus is not a person among people. He's not a person among people that has just a little touch of God in him. It's not like there's a little God dust sprinkled on this guy, so he, he is then our Savior. It's not like he is a man who somewhere along the line something great happened to him, like some religions have as their main character, and therefore he becomes godly. Jesus is godly because he's God. It's his character. You see, he is half God. The Son is not a half God or inferior to God. Jesus, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, is fully, utterly, completely God. He's distinct from the Father, yet not divided from the Father. Understand? This is one of the mysteries of the Trinity, so you guys stick with me. He's distinct from the Father, but not divided from the Father. And we sing in that hymn, Light from Light Eternal. A, mil- a moment ago, he saw Keith come up here, and there were two candles lit. And he took the flame from one and lit the third candle. Now, both of those candles are distinct, aren't they? Both provide light. And so when we think about Jesus, we, and, and, and in this particular alliteration, we say, did the flame split? Or did the illumination grow? There's actually more light here, right, than when Keith lit the candle originally. See, Christ the light comes from the light. To light our darkness. God is not diminished when Christ is on earth. As a matter of fact, there is light throughout all the darkness. Now, we also sing in this hymn, Son of the Father, begotten, not created. Now, this is really important for us to unpack. And mostly adult crowd, so I can go at this pretty simplistically. We're all created normally, okay? You understand what that biology is, right? We are all created normal. Now, we may not all have parents that necessarily loved us or nurtured us or cared us, but every one of us here has a mother and a father that are our biological source. That is from which we came. Because there's only been one that was created differently. Because we were all created through the, through the biological process that God designed. Now, the Christ event, Jesus of Nazareth coming to, to earth, happens in the middle of time. It happens in real time, uh, a 33-year period or so. Yet Jesus was present as the second person of the Trinity before the world and before time was created. And he will be present with the Trinity after the world and after time comes to its conclusion. So when we're talking about the Son of the Father begotten, not created, what that refers to is that Mary was the carrier. Obviously, we know virgins don't carry babies unless there's certain circumstances, and this is the only one we really actually know of, where God has 
taken the second person of the Trinity and they have decided to allow Mary as the, as the mother to, to carry him. And therefore, when we say begotten, what we're talking about is a permanent relationship that precedes any event in time, which is why we can rightfully say Jesus Christ was, is, and is to come. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The third verse of this hymn takes a different turn. It says, Sing choirs of angels, sing in exultation. O sing, all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. It says, When we sing, O come, let us adore him. It says, Everyone sings glory. Everyone sings glory. I've got to tell you a story. I was, I was in a church a few years ago, 15 or so years ago. One of my friends was the pastor there. He, he invited me up to north central Iowa. I, I've tried to make a joke of it, but I, it was in Mason City, all right? I didn't want to tell anybody where it was, but it was in Mason City. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, too bad. So I went to this church to, to do their consecration Sunday. My friend who was doing his best he could, and he brought me up on the stage. Now, I was not anywhere close to the talented, nor am I now, as the people we have sing in church. I know from time to time the pastor gets cast in lead role, you know, of lead singer. And all I can say to every congregation ever that's ever had me in that role, sorry, you know, <laughs> because that's not my main skill. That's not my main asset. But in that particular congregation, as Doug and I stood in front of several hundred people in this beautiful old sanctuary with a great big pipe organ going, I'm singing to my heart, you know, as loud as I can. Doug's singing, and I'm about three verses in. I'm like, I can't hear any of them singing. And I looked down at them, and they just looked like a bunch of frumpy grumpies. And I turned to him, and I said, they know they can sing out loud, don't they? He says, I don't know if they have them in it. And I said, Doug, everybody's got it in it. And I'll prove it to you. Watch this. I was at Kinnick Stadium earlier this year. Maybe some of you have been there, too. And there's kids at each corner of that stadium. And at a certain point in the time, usually in a TV timeout, one of them picks up a big flag. And he says, and he waves it in front of them. And all of them on this side say, I. And these ones over here say, oh. And these ones. Hey. Hey. All right. So you know that. And if you go to Iowa State, if you, if you go to a Cyclone game, you got the, you got the students at both ends. I was in Hilton not too long ago. And one group of students go, Cyclone. And the other end goes, Okay, so you know it, all right? <clears throat> so you've got all this in you. So, so the thing I said to my friend Doug on that, st- on that chancel, I said, why don't they put some pop into their praise? And he said, I don't think they have it in them. And I said, I know they have it in them. I just proved that you have it in you. I-O-W-A, Cyclone Power. If we can yell some praise that way, we can some, put some pop into the singing that we do in here. You're not going to sing any worse than me. I guarantee you that. But when we sing, we're to sing in exaltation. We're to show some lively, triumphant joy. We're supposed to rejoice exceedingly in elation, in jubilation. And it's all about praise, not pitch. We just sing glory. And I love this second verse, this third verse, where it says, sing choirs of angels. It means everyone sings glory. Not, not, not only does everyone sing glory, it sings <clears throat> everywhere glory is sung. See, angels are to sing glory to God. Now, angels aren't us. None of us can become angels. Angels are eternal beings that are created separately as messengers and servants of God. And in this hymn, we sing some biblical truth which is to say they are to exalt God. Now, then the hymn says, citizens of heaven above. That includes the angels. But it also includes the saints of God. Now, the saints of God are the eternal souls of human beings that have experienced human death, and because they receive Christ in their life, are present to exalt God then. So as we exalt God now and put some pop into our praise, So shall we then, because you see, we're part of a choir that's going to be singing for a long time. So we need to get our hearts and our minds around praising God with some real pop behind it. Now, the sixth verse is where I want to go, because the fourth and and fifth verses are are verses that are traditionally attributed to to Methodists, that we've put those in our particular hymnal. The the traditional fourth verse is is this verse, O come, uh, come, all ye faithful. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, 
now in flesh appearing. This is the Christmas verse. This is the Christmas morning verse. When we sing, oh, come, let us adore him, we say, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. The promise that was once heard and only heard, the promise that was once only passed on from generation to generation now comes to life in Jesus Christ. The hopes of all the faithful of hundreds, maybe thousands of years, every prophecy ever written is now fulfilled in three dimensions in the person, Jesus, who we call Christ. So we sing out. We're the Father now of flesh appearing. We greet God with glory. Now, don't make it hard. We sometimes want to make this so complicated. Just party. Just celebrate. Greet and treat God as the one and only. And it's a happy morning we sing. Because, man, oh, happy day. This is basic scriptural message. Once we were a people that was far off from God. But God, wanting us to be with him, came in Jesus Christ. Once we were separated, but God now has come to be with us. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. And let your happiness go way beyond proper. Sing praise and glory to him. And the chorus, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let me tell you why I think it was appropriate to sing it at that camp. Let me tell you why I like starting worship with it in here every once in a while. Let me tell you why I think it's appropriate to sing now in our Christmas Eve services. Because there is nothing anywhere that's more important to the human life than to come to Jesus. He is so willing to be your all in all. He's willing to rescue you from your sins and this world of one thing after another. He's willing to give you a fresh start, a pristine soul without any dark blemishes. He's willing to give you purpose for going on day to day. He's willing to be the king of your life. And the question that I said a few minutes ago is the only question you need to know now. Are you willing to receive him? And adore him. And if you are, why not today? You know, so many times we wake up for church, we come, you know, we might have waded through some fog, we didn't have to slip on any ice, but we kind of expect the same things. We expect the coffee to be hot and the donuts to be high V, you know? We kind of expect a couple of nice, you know, people to meet us on the way in. We kind of expect our praise team to to lead us in some outstanding music. We pretty much expect Pastor Keith and Mike, in some ways, to come up here and thunder away in in, in the ways we normally do. So we think a lot of things are going to be the same. But sometimes, you know, we wake up and we say, you know, I get all this and it's all true, but I'm lacking something. I might have dabbled in church. I might have been here 13 years, 30 years, you know, 83 years. And I've never really just said, you know what, God, I do receive you. And I'm willing to serve you. I'm coming to you today. And I think it would be inappropriate for the pastor from time to time not to offer you the explanation and the opportunity to say that if you want Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you want to begin living with and in him now, if you want to come and adore him, this is what you might need to do. It's easy to say, important to do. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity that's come here to live on earth. Receive him into your life and receive the forgiveness that he brings us and then simply invite the Holy Spirit to lead you in every single moment of your life. And if you're there, then I'm going to take you to prayer right now. And if you're not there, I'd ask that you pray for those who may be willing to come today. Would you you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, on this morning, this Sunday morning, we came into the sanctuary and we saw the, the beauty of the, of the poinsettias and the lights and the wreaths. We, we celebrated in the exaltation of you in the, in the worship music and we laid our hearts before us as, at you as Keith read scriptures and prayed. And now we come to a moment, Lord, a moment that maybe some of us never had before, a moment where we finally decide enough of me, Lord, and more of you. Lord, there's some of us that have shells harder than a turtle around our hearts. So we ask that you might break that shell and allow ourselves to pour ourselves out. And we invite you to pour yourself into us. And so right now, I just take a moment for that one or two or five people that are here this morning that say, I need to come and adore Jesus today. And if that's you, then would you just pray along with me? Dear Lord, I thank you 
for all that you've done to this day. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe in you. I receive you and desire to live with you and for you all of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Pastor Stan used to always say at the end of a call at summer games, he'd stand right down at the bottom or the middle or wherever it is and say, if you made that call, come up and shake my hand because you've made the most important decision that you've ever made in all of your life. And Pastor Keith and I won't stand here because our children's program's coming up in a few minutes. We won't get in the way of getting all that ready. But we would love to hear from you if you've uh, made a decision today, and we'd love to help you and grow your discipleship in any way we can. So don't be hesitate to say, hey, I made the call today. Don't, don't, don't worry if you've been a member for 50 years. That's not important to us. What's important to us is that you allow yourself uh, to let Jesus lead you.